Um, thank you, Fred, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, Truth and Toleration, which was a short book or a monograph that I wrote 20 years ago, and it was in the context of a dispute within the objectivist movement, um, a rather bitter controversy, um, that led to a schism um, between two branches of the movement and two ways of thinking about it, um, which persist down to this day. Truth and Toleration was, a, uh, as I said, a short book or a monograph. It was at, at both a work of philosophy and a manifesto. And I want to talk about um, both aspects of it today. As a work of philosophy, it addressed a range of issues that um, surrounded the nature of objectivism as a system of thought. Uh, it was also a manifesto declaring how I thought a healthy objectivist movement should function. So what I want to do today is talk both about the, the uh, manifesto aspect um, in terms of what's happened over the last 20 years uh, in the movement and also um, about the philosophical issues, uh, particularly the question of whether objectivism is an open or a closed system of ideas. So let me, let me uh, start with the beginning um, in the late 1980s. Uh, after Ayn Rand's death in 1982, a number of enterprises were started by objectivists. At the time, the movement began um, reorganizing after a period of no real formal organization. George Reisman and Edith Packer start, began offering summer conferences at the Thomas Jefferson School. The Ayn Rand Institute was formed in 19, uh, uh, 1985 at the uh, uh, inspiration of, Len of Ed Snyder, uh, who brought together a group of uh, the intellectual leaders and a plan was formed. At the time, I was working as an independent um, scholar, a freelance writer. I, was, uh, um, it, I had published uh, my book, The Evidence of the Senses, which would develop the objectivist theory of perception um, at, at a, a more academic depth. Um, I was active in the objectivist movement. I was on the, the uh, Speakers Bureau of the Ayn Rand Institute, and I was traveling all over the country speaking to student groups. Um, but then, um, uh, here we have the, uh, some of the, okay. I'll skip the student group slide. But then Barbara Brandon's book, The Passion of Ayn Rand, was published in 1986. And uh, it was revealed that there had been the breakup between Nath Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon had been highly personal as well as uh, anything else that it was um, uh, made public at the time. And uh, in giving an a, a autobiographic slash um, a memoir picture of Ayn Rand and Barbara's uh, time in the, in the inner circle, uh, it was not as Flat, a fully flattering picture. She's a great admirer of Rand and, and uh, portrayed her in heroic terms, but also some of the flaws and also some of the, uh, let's call them, uh, dysfunctionalities of the objectivist movement in the 1960s. When the book was published, most of the leaders um, of the movement followed the example of Leonard Peikoff and refused to, to uh, speak about it. They refused to discuss it internally or to say anything for the external world, even though the book was getting a lot of attention at the time. Um, uh, the, the, the only thing that they did was to denounce it. Uh, I couldn't go along with that policy, and um, the fact that I, I didn't was the beginning of um, the end for my association with the, uh, with the other intellectual leaders of the movement at the time. And, during the same period, I, was, I wrote a good deal of political commentary for Barron's Business Magazine and other places. And um, in that connection, um, I, I spoke with, got to know a lot of libertarians at other organizations such as Cato and IHS. And I became more and more interested in opening a dialogue with them. There had been a historic alienation between objectivists and libertarians. And when I finally um, uh, went to speak to a libertarian group um, about why the defense of liberty needed the core values of objectivism, ethical and um, also the, the, the um, primacy of reason. When I went to, to make that case, um, I was um, denounced by um, one, one leader, oops, sorry, 
Fred, I'm getting used to your machine. Um, Peter Schwartz wrote an article um, denouncing me, and that was sort of the, uh, the beginning of a quick, very fast spiral. Uh, the conflict deepened when I, when I went beyond those points to call for, uh, uh, this was an open letter I wrote at the time and circulated, it got copied endless, <clears throat> endlessly. I think, I think I sent out 60 copies and I got at least 60 letters back from people, including some I knew I didn't send it to because I didn't know them. Um, so I don't know what the, what the uh, multiplier is, but, uh, but the, core, uh, the core point that I made is in this paragraph, <clears throat> that Ayn Rand had left us a magnificent system of ideas, but it's not a closed system. It's a powerful engine of integration. Let's not starve it of fuel by shutting our minds to what is good in other, appro <clears throat> other approaches. Let us test our ideas in open debate. If we're right, we have nothing to fear. If we're wrong, we have something to learn. Yes, thank you, Rita. That would be lovely. Um, above all, let us encourage independent thought among ourselves. <clears throat> Welcome dissent and the restless ways of the explorers among us. <clears throat> Nine out of ten I new ideas will be mistakes, I said, but the tenth will add in the light. And when I look, <clears throat> when I look back, I'm kind of astounded that this seemed obvious to me. <clears throat> and I thought what I was doing was just reminding people of what we all stood for. But, um, but one thing did lead to another. <clears throat> and um, Leonard uh, Peikoff uh, responded with a um, denunciation of what I had said. And eventually, um, quickly thereafter, um, the, um, I left the company of the Ayn Rand Institute at Leonard's uh, insistence. <clears throat> so, with George Walsh, another philosopher who had uh, been, a, like me, an intellectual leader, he was almost the, uh, the uh, eminence grees, the, probably the most respected um, um, intellectual of the time of that, of that uh, group of people in terms of his scholarly achievements. Um, joined with me to form the Institute for Objectivist Studies. Uh, we wanted to make this a new venture, an opening for uh, what George at the time uh, called a, um, <clears throat> a home for homeless objectivists. <laughs> um, and so we launched that, uh, that institute. Um, Ten years later, we, the uh, organization had grown, it had changed its name to the, uh, I'm sorry, at, at, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, at the same time, I, I published this book, this uh, Truth and Toleration, as a, uh, uh, a pamphlet, really, and distributed. We sold it for a while. And the issues that were raised in that book, and now I'll get to the, more of the philosophical content, uh, one had to do with the issue of dealing with libertarians. Are we sanctioning libertarians merely by speaking to them? And I argued, no, sanction, you sanction something by saying I sanction it. Um, it's like promising. You can't make a promise unless you say, I promise. Um, if, uh, if you go, and I actually, in this one um, event that I spoke at, I, when I was asked, I said, okay, I, I'd be interested in coming to talk can I talk about why I think you guys need objectivism? And I said, can you talk about that? Great, we'd love to hear that. So I said, okay, there's no question of sanction here. <laughs> um, I'm coming to make my point, I was invited. And that, it, so the whole, this whole attitude seemed um, peculiar, uh, unjustified to me. Um, as you read in the short um, segment, I, um, or passage I, put up on the screen a moment ago, I argued for toleration, engaging in active debate and discussion, even with people that we know we disagree with. Um, 
And that was another issue that um, uh, I wrote a chapter about in the book. Both of those issues, by the way, it turned out to revolve around a deeper question of what came to be called the scope of honest error. Um, when can you say that ideas are evil and that someone is evil just for believing them? And that uh, was something that I thought was wrongly put, wrongly stated, that um, ideas per se are either true or false. People are good or evil or innocently mistaken, depending on how they got to those ideas. And there are many, there are many ways of going wrong, um, short of gross evasion in philosophy. I happen to know from my own history of, of uh, <clears throat> having to struggle through ideas <laughs> and correct mistakes. Uh, then there was the issue of objectivism as an open system. Leonard Peikoff had said that it's a closed system, and so I developed uh, my arguments on that score. And finally, um, I said, you know, this movement is functioning like a, um, a you know, in kind of tribalistic way. There's a concrete bound mentality of treating the principles of objectivism as um, formulaic statements and a fear of putting it any other way than the way Rand put it. And also, uh, in the movement, a, a very tribal arrangement with a hierarchy and inner circle and so forth. This is not how uh, a healthy movement works, I argued. So now, 10 years later, um, the Institute for Objectivist Studies had become the Objectivist Center. We um, were, uh, we had done a huge amount, but there had not, and there had, uh, in terms of our developing our programs, there had been many um, online discussions about the issues that I raised in Truth and Toleration. Um, but we were long since had sold out the stock that I had printed initially, so we republished as um, the book as a contested legacy of Ayn Rand in conjunction with transaction publishers. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on now to um, the present day. Over the course of 20 years, um, a, a huge amount has happened in, in some ways and in other ways not much has changed. Uh, for one thing, there's the rise, there is, this is a change, there is a, uh, what we call the rising curve of recognition, Ayn Rand and objectivism. Um, as Ed pointed out earlier, um, sales of Atlas have continued at a very high level for, for two decades, rising slowly, and then just recently this burst in connection with um, political events. At the same time, the, uh, we see the, the growth of, of independent objectivism. Uh, we, we, I think, were the first large-scale national organization to go out on its own, and uh, now there are many, many such, way too many to name. I'll just uh, give you a, a couple of, of examples. There's Atlasphere. Um, that was actually originally came from uh, the idea was was uh, came from Charles Tomlinson, who was one of our close members. Um, Josh Zader took it and ran with it. I, the last time I looked, they had over twenty thousand members. Um, <clears throat> there is uh, uh, Robert Krasinski's intellectual activist. He was formerly associated with ARI, but um, parted company with them um, for various reasons, and he's now producing this as a daily um, email. Uh, bulletin. There's the uh, Jefferson School, um, uh, George Richardson and Edith Packer have also part of company with the Ayn Rand Institute and, and their former colleagues. Um, and the, although they no longer run conferences, they have a very large website and educational programs. There's all these online forums. I picked the, the, the uh, first few that um, were within immediate reach of my browser. Um, the Rebirth of Reason, Objectivist Living, Solo. Not all of these are totally friendly to us. I'm not saying the independent movement is monolithic, that quite the opposite. Um, but the, the point is they are on their own. They have been started to pursue objectivism without feeling any need for permission from anyone above. And finally, of course, I cannot uh, Fail to mention the Atlas Shrugged film, which is now being made in uh, Los Angeles by John Aglioloro. And I think, I hope, but I really believe that this will dwarf all these other activities in its impact. 
Um, the Atlas Society, as we now are, and the Ayn Rand Institute uh, for uh, at least a decade and a half had no interaction, and I mean no interaction. I, I think I sent a few letters at one time to um, never answered. Uh, there was zero communication between the principals. Several years ago, um, um, Ed and I and John Aguilero did meet with Yaron Brook and John Allison. I'll say a word about that in a moment. Um, but there has been one significant, very significant change um, that the, from the very beginning, we collaborated with libertarian groups um, such as Cato. We were selective, but there were many groups that we were proud to be involved with. And uh, now what's interesting is that the Ayn Rand Institute is doing likewise. They, several years ago, they launched a campaign to um, network and uh, join hands with, um, collaborate in various ways with uh, the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, for one, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I know there are others. And um, we actually asked Yaron, uh, oh, so what happened here? Um, you're doing something that used to be a no-no from the standpoint that you represent. And he said, uh, well, times changed, you know, circumstances evolve. Um, uh, it reminded me of, of a kind of a, a point about the way movements um, work. There's, this is a digression, but there is a pattern in intellectual groups, whether they're objectivist or Marxist, um, Freudians, Islamists, or whatever. And that is that when the party line shifts, there's still no redemption um, for those who shifted too soon. Bef <laughs> uh, bef <laughs> before before world historical conditions made it politically correct to do so. Um, however, uh, the, there is still a great deal of hostility. And several years ago, they um, um, began a campaign, I don't know if they're still trying this, but um, to um, uh, lure our uh, board members away from us. And um, they actually said, John, Allison, and uh, Yaron said, well, we'd like you to just go away. You're an obstacle to our growth. We need, we need control over um, um, the public representation of objectivism. <clears throat> um, and their clubs still do not allow our speakers. They, their book service does not sell my books. We sell, or when we had an active store, sold their works. Um, so in that sense, hostilities have continued as before. Um, but in any case, the issue, it's very clear now that of the issues that were uh, major issues in 1990, the one remaining one uh, is the issue of whether objectivism is an open or a closed system. Sorry. Um, so let's move on to that. <clears throat> this issue was, as it was, when I said in that brief um, open letter, but objectivism is not a closed system, um, I thought, I, I literally thought, I didn't pause a second in writing that sentence. I thought this was so obvious um, and so congruent. I thought, okay, everyone's going to agree with this. Um, well, it turned out they didn't, and Leonard Peikoff, in his response, um, made a case for why objectivism is closed. Uh, here is the case. Uh, there are really two arguments. One um, is that a philosophical system by nature is unlike any other mode of knowledge, any other discipline or field of knowledge, because it's a totality of logically integrated principles that cover every fundamental issue in philosophy. Uh, because the system covers all issues, it is complete, there are no gaps, no fundamental issues to which it uh, lacks an answer. And because the system is integrated, no element can be changed without altering the whole system. It has a fixed identity. The underlying claim is that unlike science, philosophy is based on observations that are available to human beings at any stage of history. They do not require uh, experimentation or other advanced scientific forms of induction. 
And so there is no new inductive evidence to be had once a genius integrates what's always been available. The second argument um, is that objectivism is a name Rand chose for her philosophical ideas. So in a way, not everyone goes quite this far. Um, not, not, not every adherent of this position goes quite this far. Uh, but some do and say that it, it is, that means it is her intellectual property, like the title Atlas Shrugged, or her own personal name. And um, those who take it are, are in effect violating intellectual property. Uh, that will not wash in law. I happen to know this because we checked it. Um, <clears throat> but morally, that is the claim. Um, some would even go so far as to say that objectivism is a proper noun. It's not a concept or, or a, a name for an abstract um, view that is, can be held in different forms by different people, but that actually literally refers to some, I, I, I don't actually know what. There's a, I'd love to get into the semantics of, of common versus proper versus abstract nouns. Uh, that's kind of where I do a lot of <laughs> my, my scholarly thinking, but um, in any case, the point is that objectivism, the result of this uh, uh, way of looking at it, is objectivism means all and only the philosophical ideas that Rand put forward, and, or, or herself in her writings, or that she endorsed. Uh, now, it, in truth and toleration, initially, uh, I examined these arguments. I actually formulated them, I think, um, uh, I think I formulated them a little more clearly than they had been formulated before and um, answered them in depth. And over 20 years, there has been no counter argument or analysis uh, that I've been able to find by Leonard Peikoff or any of the principals in the movement. Um, there's a lot of online discussion, but um, the what I, at a certain point I stopped reading it because I was, I was just hearing the same arguments. Leonard's arguments on one side, my arguments on the other. And so preparation for this talk, I actually went and spent some time looking around and, and I'm sorry, um, I, I don't see it. Uh, so for that reason and for time constraints, um, this is not the time or the place to, uh, for me to analyze and um, debunk these arguments. It's all there in the book, um, and uh, as I think it was Robert Frost who once said, some poet, I think it was Frost who once said when he was asked to explain the meaning of a poem, uh, Madam, I could only repeat myself less perfectly. <laughs> <clears throat> but I do want to raise some questions um, that I find just genuinely puzzling and I think reveal that there is some problem with, this, with that perspective. <clears throat> um, one is just how do you determine which of Rand's statements are philosophical and which are not? Um, it's only the philosophical statements that objectivism is supposed to refer to. For example, in the middle third of Galt's speech, and I know this because I outlined the whole thing, it's online on our website. The middle third is an analysis of the mystic altruist collectivist axis. It is driven by her philosophical perspective, but it also involves cultural analysis, some psychology, uh, and so forth. Is that, is that part of what was closed or not? I don't know. Um, Secondly, can anyone other than Rand, if, if it stands for all and only what Rand thought, can anyone other than Rand be an objectivist? I mean, I would, I would ne if that's what I thought objectivism was, yes, I would, I, I, I have enough humility to say, no, I, I'm not Ayn Rand. <laughs> I, my mind does not mirror hers. Um, And if others can call themselves objectivists, uh, well then how do you tell what's the criterion? I tried to lay out the, what I thought were the basic principles of objectivism, the framework that was essential to the system and within which debate might happen. I've never heard anyone else on the other side lay out the whole thing. Um, and I don't know what it would be like to lay out the entire philosophical contents of the mind of a genius. Um, if Rand had not, I, another question, Rand's philosophy was developed over time as she figured, uh, addressed one issue after another. If she had not gotten around to self-esteem as a core value, but someone else, say uh, a psychologist who was working with her, um, had, had originated the, uh, the, that formulation of, of, of that, 
Would that not be part of objectivism? Well, she did endorse it at the time. So, but you get my point. Take any thesis of objectivism. If, if, if Rand had not, <laughs> if, it's, if it's part of objectivism now, the claim is it's tightly integrated with everything else. Well, suppose she just hadn't gotten to that point. Someone else did and tightly integrated it. Um, another question, if orthodox objectivist scholars are not adding to the content of objectivism, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, the Institute is putting a huge amount of money into getting its scholars into academic positions. If they're not, if they're not doing research to advance objectivism, okay. I, what, I, I have no idea. I don't, if I were in that position, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, and finally, if they do not cite high quality work by other objectivists, as is way too often the case, um, um, by scholars who refuse to even to mention works that done by me or by others um, who are not um, sanctioned by them, is that objective scholarship? If they refuse to mention something even that is they would consider to be true, well then what is it they value more highly than truth? <clears throat> now these are the questions that um, uh, I have raised and um, unfortunately there's been very little opportunity to engage in the kind of open discussion where um, I suspect I would, I would learn that um, I have a straw man conception um, of them as I think they do of, of, of our approach. And, uh, but unfortunately it hasn't happened, um, which is one of the real costs um, of, this, uh, of this schism. But I do want to say, when you look at the, at the way people actually function, um, scholars, and I, I do, there are ven venues in which um, scholars from both sides do meet and um, uh, they're rare, but they, they're, uh, actually there's one, the uh, Ayn Rand Society at the uh, philosophy conventions. Um, but when we talk, when we, on those few occasions when we do engage in any kind of dialogue, you know, they function just the way I do when they're dealing, when, when the issue is not this one, is it open or closed, but when it's some other real substantive philosophical issue, they function the same way all of us do in the field. Any professional philosopher would. What's the issue? Is, is there a clearly defined question here? Do I have to define some of the terms? What are the facts that give rise to this issue? Um, how does it relate to what I already know, uh, including what I know of uh, the, the objectivist framework, and so on and so forth? Um, before I parted company with them, we had, we had countless conversations on issues that Rand hadn't really gone into in depth. Um, and although, you know, we, were trying to be, we did try to be careful about what was pretty well established um, and what was new and kind of speculative and still tentative, subject to you know, a lot more discussion and debate. We tried to make that distinction, but I don't remember anyone even raising the question, is this objectivist or not? Um, so I think the, the issue has taken on a kind of life of its own as an abstraction that is unfortunate, but it is, as an abstraction, it, it has very definite impacts um, in fracturing the movement. Now, I do want to make two points that I've, I have encountered. Um, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm, in the interest of time, I, I, I will move on. I think there are certain specific misunderstandings that I know they have of us, uh, which I'd be happy to comment on on some other occasion. Um, but let me move on to the, uh, um, the psychology of the debate. <clears throat> I think there is something in the way people engage with ideas and specifically integrated ideas that are not only uh, intellectually powerful but that relate to a way of life. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, there is a psychological factor at work. I, I think one aspect of it is that uh, has to do with to what extent people f have feel that their personal identity is bound up with being an objectivist and being in a certain place in the movement. Um, did Rand change my life? Well, yeah, most of us who, who are called, would call ourselves objectivists, 
could say Rand changed my life. But, but there's a deeper issue of whether I still feel like I'm the same person I was before I read The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged or whatever. Um, there's some people who say no, it's like that was my, that was a, that was my life as an Irish maid in the 17th century. You know, I've been re reborn here as a, um, and that breeds a kind of, of conservatism or it goes along with a kind of conservatism um, in ideas. It may, to an extent, be just a matter of cognitive style. And you know, it's been said that um, all humans are either Whigs or Tories, meaning they're, they're, they lean toward the more conservative, let's test it before we change, versus that's the Tory that, versus the Whigs. Um, new idea, great, let's try it. Um, but there is in movements, intellectual movements, um, certainly in religions, we see something very similar, the, an entire apparatus of excommunication, uh, apostasy, and so forth. Um, and the, the early Christian church, it's interesting that um, pe people outside objectivism do not understand why there's such animosity about this among people who, to someone outside the, who's not deeply versed in the philosophy, I, you guys believe all the same things. What's the matter? But there is this pattern. Um, the early Christian church never went after infidels. Um, and pagans uh, with the same ferocity that it uh, persecuted heretics. Um, in, in Islam, it's interesting, the same Arabic word, bida, um, is, means innovation and heresy. Uh, it's one of the tighter connections <laughs> that I've found. Um, and I think objectivists, this is one way in which ob objectivists are, are human beings we are subject to some of the same motives, impulses, habits, and, uh, and, and faults as other people who have gravitated to other uh, points of view. Um, in particular, in regard to innovation, the hard, I think the hard truth is that uh, everyone, at least in America, but everyone loves the idea of innovation. It's exciting, it's romantic, it's heroic. But not many people actually like the reality when they encounter it because it wrecks their lives, it changes their lives, it upsets things, they have to rethink all kinds of things. And so there is a native resistance to it. Um, I do want to emphasize um, in regard to the, um, the uh, psychology of the debate um, that, uh, I'm sorry, in regard to the uh, is, issue of open or closure. Open does not mean, I've said this many times, but I have to say it every time I can, Openness and tolerance do not mean intellectual lackness, sloppiness. Um, there's a difference between uh, regarding a philosophy as closed and maintaining high standards of logic, proof, knowledge of the literature. We maintain those. I, I feel that strongly. Um, the whole point is um, that uh, the, in opening the door, the door to toleration, I did, uh, certainly did not mean to say, okay, everyone's welcome. You know, when, when I, at first when we started a new organization, George and I noticed that um, we had this feeling that uh, once we issued this call uh, and said it was, it's open, it, it was like the country tilted and everything loose kind of rolled in our, started rolling in our direction. And um, those were the nine out of the 10 ideas that were mistakes. <laughs> we, there were a lot of them. Um, the fact is that they're, they're the same standards. In fact, we, I think we apply them more rigorously because you know, being in an inner circle, um, being in agreement with someone gets you nowhere in, an, in the arguments as we try to maintain the flow. Um, <clears throat> okay, on to the future and I will wrap up. Um, I think there's, there's ongoing um, division in the academic at the, between two, these two camps of objectivism and the academic level, and that's because academics are professional workers and ideas. They, they have a, a professional vested strong interest in taking positions and also in being part of, of a professional networks. That, um, so there's a, a, a kind of built-in resistance there, but at the same time I have, to, I have to say that the academic world is one of the, in, in general, um, is 
very, very um, unhospitable to any idea of a closed philosophy or to uh, scholars who will not discuss ideas and issues with other scholars for reasons having um, to do with the kinds of things that are grounds for sanction and objectivism. And there have been cases where um, uh, grants uh, offers to fund chairs from the Ayn Rand Institute or the Anthem Foundation were turned down because they didn't want to. It was hard enough for, for most philosophy departments to accept money from outside, harder for them to accept to, to fund objectivist studies. But when you say, oh, and all the people in it have to come, have to be trained by the Ayn Rand Institute, that, that is really um, uh, something that is academics resist and quite properly. Um, I think out in the, um, outside the academic world where people are living and working and starting ventures and engaging in political activism, um, the issues are less, uh, th this division is, is less of a, uh, a crux. There are, of course, people um, who have very strong, passionate feel interests and feelings about one side or the other. I know that, but I think they're outnumbered by uh, the people who read Atlas Shrugged, maybe they read things on our, on our website or come to our conferences, maybe they read things on the, on the other or more orthodox sites and go to their conferences. What they want is to learn stuff, learn what they can, take away, and go live their lives. However, at the same time, I have to say that I know, and I'm sure all of, uh, many of you anyway, um, know, have met people who, who might otherwise have been uh, drawn to objectivism, but who were repelled by running into some self-righteously dogmatic uh, objectivist. There is something, um, I can't resist this, this next point about the natural history of schisms. There is a pattern that applies across objectivism and other areas. Um, the breaks and schisms are, are really not unique to objectivism. In intellectual history, there are many examples. Freudianism uh, and the expulsion of Carl Jung um, is one highly significant example. There were similar fissures in the uh, Marxist movement. Uh, a friend of mine who's a specialist in early modern philosophy, that is eighth, uh, 17th uh, century, um, sent me this example. I didn't know anything about it. It kind of tickled me. Um, she said, the, net, the, uh, the diffusion of Cartesianism, uh, you know, the followers of Rene Descartes. The diffusion of Cartesianism in the latter half of the 17th century was complicated by several sorts of factors. One was the nature of Cartesianism itself. No other philosophy in the early modern period produced such a dogmatic school of adherents who nonetheless disputed bitterly as to what their doctrine should be. <laughs> <clears throat> but there is a, the pattern is like this, and it's happened many times. A brilliant, charismatic thinker comes up with a new set of ideas that draws followers who are excited and energized to learn and expand what they're doing, um, who sit at, their, at the feet of the thinker to um, study. Some stay as disciples, um, become part of a movement to promote the ideas as their life's work. Um, a network is formed, a movement, and human beings what they are. Um, pe some people are better than others. Some people are closer to the thinker. You begin to have a hierarchy, an inner circle, and rings radiating, uh, radiating outward. At some point, the inner circle is disrupted. Sometimes the, the, uh, the crux or the turning point is a personal business, personal affair. Um, I, I mean affair in the most general sense here, <laughs> although it, it can be the other kind. Um, sometimes it's a new line of thought, um, but at some point there's a rupture. Some disciples stay with the founder and become um, highly protective of the founder and of the integrity of the system, refusing to brook any opposition or dissent. <clears throat> Others form rival parties within the movement or leave the movement altogether. In that first generation of followers, the conflicts are, intellectual conflicts are, um, highly charged with personal animosities and with accusations, moralistic accusations of betrayal and irrationality. Uh, and so people um, stop talking to each other. But, and here's the good news. As with succeeding generations, the personal issues sort of fade in everyone's mind um, as the leaders 
move on to wherever they go. Um, by the third or fourth generation, people are, um, uh, it's opened up. And then at that point, the ideas stand or fall on their own. The broad system of ideas, if its adherents are persuasive enough and it has um, effective, um, if it has started an effective research program, and the ideas of each individual follower as well. So I, I, that's what I expect from objectivism. Um, I see it beginning to happen already. It, I think it will continue. Um, I want to say um, one final thing about the, the new generation. Those of you who are in the generations to come um, as intellectual leaders, if you want to advance the philosophy of objectivism, whether as an intellectual, a scholar, or an activist working um, at a think tank, for example, it will take a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline, <clears throat> and a real uh, commitment to the goal of knowledge. And that goal should take precedence over any loyalty to persons or to organizations. I urge you to seek knowledge, <clears throat> seek knowledge wherever you can from whoever promises to offer it, whoever can offer you insight or training or feedback or connections or whatever whether it's the Atlas Society or the Ayn Rand Institute or any other organization that comes along. Don't get hung up in the partisan politics of the objectivist movement. In saying that, however, um, I have to add that I am giving voice to my own, to my own commitment to open objectivism. You will not hear that advice from the other side. And so I also have to warn you that the one thing you cannot compromise is the integrity of your own mind, your independence, your own perception and loyalty to the way you perceive truth. I would say that nothing is worth giving that up, whether it's position or a salary or tenure um, or even knowledge itself, um, except that I know you can't truly get those things if, that, if you give up your core. So stay the course, uh, bring in the light. And if you do that, I think nothing else will matter very much down the road. For these reasons, and maybe even native optimism on my part, um, I think the sun that is pictured here on our logo is still rising, as Benjamin Franklin said at the Constitutional Convention, is it a rising or a setting sun? I think it's still rising for the objectivist movement. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, this is my vision, and I thank you for hearing it and taking part. Questions, ask them to use the microphone. Okay. Um, I'm told we have time for three questions, and it looks like. Yes. No, it's Bill. Um, well, it's changed in many ways. The, the quickest summary is that. Um, I think under Yaron Brook, who I believe became its executive director in year 2000, um, it has, I have to, from the outside, it looks as if he's managed it very effectively. It's grown substantially. Um, it's made a large alliance with John Allison, um, who funds its programs as well as the, his own programs, all of which are forming um, a fairly expansive network. Um, it is more, um, interested, and again, I think this is uh, some leadership culture issues that came down from the top, um, uh, on making the best case for objectivism. It's still, uh, it tends to have um, a, a style, a somewhat in-your-face style in its political activism, but also, uh, I mean, I've heard Yaron speak many times, and he's quite personable. And it's, it's, um, the style is very different from what you would get from Leonard Peikoff or from many of the others. Um, the, and as I mentioned in my talk, they are now, um, uh, have basically 
abandoned any issue about libertarians. Um, they've opened uh, that avenue. The one remaining issue, and um, I, I mentioned that I had, we had a meeting with um, Iran a couple years ago. The one remaining issue is this open versus closed, on which I said, uh, I, actually, I just asked, I, are you still, is it still ARI policy that um, the Institute and everyone involved with it must agree with fact and value, Leonard Peikoff's answer, and he said yes. That is still our view. Um, so in that sense, and that and the other things that have, um, the practices that follow with that, along with that, um, continue. Hi, Steve. Hey, David. Um, I'm really curious whether that means that they have rescinded the uh, distinction of knowing, ha believing a, an idea which is as inherently an evil idea is actually in itself a, a value uh, that you are therefore an evil person for holding that idea. But, but my real question was those two ways in which uh, the uh, ARI group uh, misunderstands us. You said that there were a couple ways where you feel that they misunderstand us. Mm -hmm. Do you have a chance to t explain oh, that? <laughs> thank you for inviting um, a piece that I cut for time. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll be quick here because um, I, I don't want to take up uh, all the question time with it. But Two things. One is, there is a distinction in philosophy, in academic philosophy uh, as a field, between historical scholarship um, and what we call issue philosophy or, or philosophizing about issues. Historical scholarship means trying to understand what a given historical thinker said, like Aristotle or Plato. There are Plato scholars, there are Aristotle scholars. In objectivism, there are Rand scholars. Um, and if you're a Rand scholar, then you do want to identify exactly what Rand said, thought, believed, what she meant by things. And uh, on the other hand, if you're an objectivist philosopher, um, say an epistemologist like, like, I, like as I am, then what you want to do is address issues in epistemology standing on the basis of objectivism, but pushing forward to try to see what are, what are the implications, how can I advance our understanding of this uh, within the framework. I think people tend to think that um, uh, not to draw that distinction very clearly. And so it said, if you're going to be an objectivist, you can't misrepresent Rand. Well, no. If you're talking about Rand, no, no you should not misrepresent her. She, if she's the object of study, you get the point, I, I, I hope. Um, the second thing is that um, I think people tend to run together the, the point that I was trying to make, and I think many of us understand, run together two, two different points. One's about toleration, a call for toleration, and one's about the, the idea that objectivism is an open system. Uh, they're related issues, but they're, but they're different. Um, it, toleration means, is a way, it's, it's a moral issue, it's a way of dealing with people that you disagree with, okay? Um, it has a negative aspect, don't judge until you know that they're culpable. Um, positive aspect, engage in debate. You might learn something. Um, that's, one, that's one issue. Whether objectivism is an open or closed system is an epistemological issue about the nature of, of the philosophy. Now, it's because I think that it's open that I think I'm very eager to practice tolerance um, in the sense of engaging in debate because I like to learn things. But it, the fact that the idea that it is an open philosophy does not mean uh, if you run them together, I think some people think that we're in saying, okay, we're going to engage with everyone and, every, and everyone gets to be included as an objectivist. You know, we tol we, in tolerating people, we're saying they are objectivists. Well, no. There are many libertarians, for example, who are not objectivists. I engage in discussion and debate with them, but that doesn't mean I would say, and for that matter, or they would say that they're objectivists. Um, so they're just two distinct issues, but people run them together. All right. So, last question. Uh, I got one. Okay. Hello, David. Uh, is this working? Yes. Okay. Well, this is my first day hearing about the closed open thing so much, <laughs> and perhaps I'm having trouble understanding it. But open objectivism sounds like a rationalization for subjectivism sometimes. If we have an objective reality and man's mind can understand it, then. I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this argument, but what about that? And uh, 
I also don't see how closed and open objectivism can be separate. Er, they're, they're two different ideas. Of course, due to the nature of people being individuals, we're going to have competition in the idea marketplace to find the best or, or correct idea. So how, how is it that open and closed approach this differently? And if they don't, then that. All right, I, I can't really answer your first question I, I, except to acknowledge that um, one of the accusations or claims uh, I've heard against this approach, my approach, is that it's subjectivist, it's skeptical, it, it pre preaches uncertainty. Um, I, I can't answer that at, at any shorter length, truly, than what I, what I wrote in the book, and so I would urge you to get a, get a copy um, and, and look at chapter Actually, the, the best chapter would, would be the one on toleration, because that's where I go into the most epistemology. Um, but yes, it's kind of interesting. We could, in, in a normal movement, um, to take your second question, uh, adherents of these two views of objectivism might have engaged in open discussion and debate <clears throat> uh, in the marketplace of ideas. And um, it's too bad that didn't happen, but it's kind of by the nature of their position that it can't these ideas can't be offered that way. So it's a, uh, there's a meta problem in that sense. Okay, Walter, you really have to be last. We're on overtime, and maybe this is just a comment. Um, having hung around what you were doing for the last 20 years, <laughs> <laughs> almost from the start, uh, one thing that helped me to understand the difference between open and closed more than anything else was your very careful, very carefully argued, very uh, scholarly conservative approach to adding a major virtue to the objectivist list, your argument for the eighth virtue of <laughs> benevolence. And if I ask myself, is there anything that the open objectivist movement has done over the last 20 years that obviously, arguably, should have been in Galt's speech, but was on that level, mm. it would be adding the virtue of benevolence the way you argued so carefully for including it. Well, thank you, Walter. That's, I appreciate it. <laughs> mm -hmm.